الحمد للہ وکفا و صلاحت و السلام علیہ الدین اصطفا خصوصا علی افدلیم و خاتم النبیم محمد الامین و علی علیہ و صحبہ اجمعین و با فعوذ باللہ من الشیطان الرجیم بسم اللہ الرحمن الرحیم ونزلنا عليك الكتابة بيانا لكل شيء وهدى ورحمة وبشرى للمسلمين صدق الله العظيم We begin with Allah's blessed name We praise him and we glorify him as he ought to be praised and glorified And we pray for peace and for blessings on all his noble messengers on our father Adam عليه السلام on our father Abraham, Ibrahim alayhi salam. On Moses, Musa alayhi salam. On Jesus, Nabi Isa alayhi salam. And on his mother, the Blessed Virgin Mary alayhi salam. And on the last of them all, the Blessed Prophet Muhammad sallallahu ta'ala alayhi wa sallam. Brothers and sisters, assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuhu. Uh, I greet you from the studios of the Islamic Broadcasting uh, Network, IBN, uh, of Trinidad and Tobago. I am grateful to its owner and its CEO, Brother Inshan Ishmael, and to the manager, the production manager, my dear friend, Brother Hasib Majid, who so kindly placed the studio at our disposal for this lecture uh, entitled From Arab Spring to Arab Spring Connecting the Dots. This is not going to be a long lecture. It is meant to prepare you for an international Islamic seminar which we've organized for uh, towards the end of January. You will find the specific dates on my website, uh, www.imranhussein.org. Uh, it will be uh, towards the end of January, and it will be held in Cape Town, the beautiful South African city of Cape Town, a seminar which should last for about five days, I believe. And uh, it will be devoted to this subject. Uh, and so what we're doing today is actually introducing it to you and giving you a taste of what is to come in that seminar. If you are in Johannesburg, if you are in Pretoria, if you are in Gaborone, if you're in Harare, if you are in Durban, if you're in Port Elizabeth, East London, wherever you are in Southern Africa, I hope you'll try to make it to the seminar uh, in Cape Town in late January yeah. on the topic from Arab Spring to Arab Spring connecting the dots just go to my website and you'll be able to register for the seminar inshallah this uh, we're breaking new ground we're breaking new ground with this topic uh, what we're doing is applying our eschatology to history. It is an eschatological interpretation of history. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has spoken to us about the sky above and he said that I have, we have ordained the lowest sky with lamps, referring to the stars as lamps. وَلَقَدْ زَيَّنَ السَّمَاءَ الدُّنْيَا بِمَصَابِحَ What is the implication of the use of the word lamp? What do we use a lamp for? We use a lamp to show us the way when we want to walk in the darkness. The lamp provides light so we can see. And so the stars in the sky are placed as lamps so we can see the direction in which to move. 
Of course, this is applicable for those traveling long distances, for example, in the sea, and they don't have landmarks by which to see the ray, the way in which to travel. And you have to look at the stars and the sky to be able to know which direction you want to sail. But if you simply look at the stars in the sky as dispersed, dispersed particles with no relationship with each other, well, how will the stars in the sky tell us which direction to sail? You have to understand the interconnected relationships between the stars in the sky, how they come together to make a whole and how they are related to each other. Only then can the stars in the sky function as lamps. We say that is the methodology for studying history. Historical events are not happening by accident. No. If you just look at history as a record of events, it will be like looking at the sky and just jumble of stars. You've got to be able to interpret history, to be able to know in which direction history is moving and in which direction you must be moving. So how do we interpret history? We are breaking new ground now by using Islamic eschatology to interpret the historical process. And that is our topic from Arab Spring to Arab Spring, connecting the dots to be able to show the interrelationship, the interrelated nature of the events which have been transpiring particularly over the last 100 years. A little later, you'll understand why I am concentrating on the figure 100 years. Why not 500? Why not 1,000? Why 100 years? And so then, let us repeat one more time that we're breaking new ground in our eschatological interpretation of history. I believe I may have to spend the rest of my life. I'm now 71 years of age, alhamdulillah. Uh, and in fairly good health, praise and thanks be to Allah. And in whatever left of my life, whatever is left, I'll have to devote it now to this subject, the eschatological interpretation of history. But I am, I'm aware that all I am doing is building a foundation for those who are to come after me because there is so much work to be done. No one has done it before. We are doing it for the first time. Arnold Toynbee is a great historian. There are many other very great historians in the world over the last hundred years. But we will be the first to interpret history from the viewpoint of Islamic eschatology. And so now let us begin with Allah's blessed name. A hundred years ago, and we say the world experienced the first Arab Spring. And now a hundred years later, the world is experiencing another Arab Spring. And we want to be able to connect them, to show the relationship, how they are connected. There were enormously important events, revolutionary events, which occurred in the Arab world a hundred years ago. Remember, it was a hundred years ago that the center of the Arab world, the Hejaz, Mecca and Medina, experienced great turmoil. The Ottoman Khalifa had appointed Sharif Hussein, Sharif bin Hussein, as the Sharif of Mecca. And it was in 1916 that he revolted, supported by the British and funded by the British by the, to the tune of seven million pounds. And you want to know where I got that information? That Sharif Hussein took seven million pounds from the British to revolt against the Ottoman Empire and to declare the Arab world independent of the Ottoman Empire. 
and then to fight with British troops against the Ottoman troops. And then finally, the Ottoman Empire loses control of the Hejaz, loses control of Makkah and Medina, loses control of the Hajj, and the Islamic credentials of the Ottoman Khalifa are destroyed. And then came, eventually, Saudi rule. This was 100 years ago. But back, where did I get that information from? That the British gave Sharif al Hussein, Sharif bin Hussein, uh, sorry, Sharif Hussein bin Ali, that was his name, Sharif Hussein bin Ali, the Sharif of Makkah, in 1914, 1915, 1916, gave him £7 million to revolt against the Khalifa in Constantinople. I wonder how much money they're giving now to all these of Dajjal's warriors <laughs> who are traveling from all over places to go to Syria, funded by the Saudi, funded by Qatar, found, funded by Turkey, funded by NATO, provided weapons by NATO to revolt and to launch this armed insurrection. I don't call it a jihad, I call it a Yankee jihad. You're annoyed with me because of that. But tomorrow you'll understand why you're misguided on the subject. That was 100 years ago. This is today. You see the connection? Where did I get this information from? You can't find this information in any Arab source today. It's all destroyed. But the British have preserved it. The greatest British historian of that era, Arnold Toynbee, edited a journal called the Survey of International Affairs every year every year and for the year 1925 you can go to the internet and find it survey of international affairs for 1925 and in that book it's a big book you see the evidence that if he was paid seven million pounds to revolt against the ottoman khalifa or caliphate and so a hundred years ago and big events were taking place, changing the Arab world. A hundred years later, the same thing is now happening. What is the connection? We want to apply Islamic eschatology to this Arab spring and the relationship between the two Arab spring. We want to turn to the Quran and to the Hadith for an explanation. Has anyone done this before? The Quran, in the very first uh, verse that I recited at the beginning of this talk, in Surah Al-Nahl, Allah declares of this Quran that it is tibyan and likul excuse me, it explains all things. Tibyan and likul lishay. Well then why aren't we going to the Quran? for an explanation of the strange world in which we live today. Look at the map of the world. And if you see a map of the world, how strange it is today that you have one part of the world dominating all the rest of the world. One people dominating all the rest of mankind. What a strange world it is. Does the Quran offer an explanation? of what's happening in the Holy Land today. When Allah gave the Holy Land to the Jews, He gave it to them not unconditionally, He gave it to them conditionally. And the condition was that you must be righteous in conduct. You must have faith in Allah. And whenever they violated that condition, Allah threw them out of the Holy Land. The last time they did it, when he threw them out, he, he broke them up into bits and pieces and scattered them all over the world. And then placed a ban that they can never return. It cannot return. They can come back as a tourist, yeah, but not to reclaim that land as their own, to reclaim Jerusalem as their own. But now what's happening? A hundred years ago, it happened. They recovered Jerusalem. They recovered the Holy Land. The British Army de defeated the Ottoman army. 
And the Jews re return to the Holy Land to reclaim it as their own. And then a state of Israel was established in the Holy Land. Is this happening by accident? Is it just random? That we just listen to a talk on the subject and we go home and have dinner and go to sleep? Or is there an explanation? Does the Quran explain what's happening in the world today? When, when, when will we be faithful to the Quran? When will we return to the Quran to seek in the Quran the answers to these questions? When will we turn to an eschatological explanation of history? When we go to the Quran, uh, in our seminar in Cape Town, of course, we'll be able to expand on the subject. At this time, I'm going to focus on only one verse of the Quran. Only one. When Fir'aun was drowning underneath the water, prior to this, he was in a position of power, arrogant power, using power to oppress. And we, the Muslims, the believers, the Israeli, the Israelites, we were all Muslims, the Israelites had no power. They had no government. They had no armed forces. No. And in that confrontation between the two, this side with the truth and this side with falsehood and oppression, it came to a climax in which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala intervened because this world is not created to continue indefinitely with oppression. No. Allah created this world with haqq, so that truth might prevail. And so Allah will intervene. And he did intervene. And he parted the water. He told Musa Islam, take the rod and strike the water. And as he struck the water, the water parted. Wa is farakna bikum al and when the water parted, we were able to cross. We were able to cross to safety. And when Pharaoh and his armed forces attempted to cross, and they were all destroyed before your very eyes. So Allah in the Quran. So when this arrogant Pharaoh who declared, Ana Rabbukum al -ala, I am the Lord Most High. What Lord are you talking about, Musa? Alayhi salam, I am God. But now he's, di he's dying, he's drowning underneath the water. And no one knew what's happening underneath the water. No one knew it. For thousands of years, no one knew it. It's not there in the Torah, it's not there in the Gospel. No one knew it. Only when the Quran was revealed, only then, for the first time, mankind got to know what happened underneath the water. Allah revealed that Pharaoh realized that he was not God. As tomorrow, Washington will probably realize that they're not God as well. And as he was dying, Pharaoh declared his faith in Allah, the God of Banu Israel. At that point, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala then intervened and he said, Al-an, now Pharaoh, now you make your declaration of faith. Waqad asayta qabl. And before this, you were in arrogant rejection and rebellion. Waqunta min al mufsirin And you were creating fasad, you were perpetrating fasad. You were corrupting and destroying in, in an era of corruption and destruction of the earth. Of the earth. This day we have ordained the preservation of your physical body. This day we have ordained, we have determined, we have decided to preserve your physical body, Pharaoh. Why are we preserving the body? Does Allah give an answer? 
the body was discovered a hundred years ago. The body of Pharaoh was discovered in 1890, uh, 90, 1898, I believe, and uh, 1898. And so we have to ask the question. Yes, Allah says he's going to preserve the body of Pharaoh, and thousands of years later, the body is discovered and preserved. And so now the question. Islamic scholarship must answer the question. The answer is there in the Quran. Why did Allah preserve the body of Fir'aun, of Pharaoh? The answer لِتَكُونَ لِمَنْ خَلْفَكَ آيَةً لِتَكُونَ لِمَنْ خَلْفَكَ آيَةً That this body of yours, when it is rediscovered, when it resurfaces in the historical process, will function as a sign for a people to come after you. What is that sign? My answer is, and you know the rule, when Imran gives an opinion, don't accept it. Do not accept my opinion unless and until you are convinced that it is correct. This is the respect I have for your intellect. This is the respect I have for your rational faculty. This is the respect I have for the independence of your thought. You will never hear me saying, don't listen to that fella. Don't listen to that fella. Not me. I never say that. They can say it. So if I give an opinion, do not accept my opinion unless and until you are convinced that it is correct. What is my opinion? What is the sign? What could be the sign? The Quran does not tell us what the sign is. We have to try to find out what the sign is. And I say, when the body of Pharaoh is discovered, that is a sign that history will now repeat itself. That the epic encounter between truth and falsehood between justice and injustice and oppression, between Musa alayhi salam and Fir'aun, that epic encounter would be reenacted on the stage of history. And this is Akhir zaman And this is the final countdown of Akhir zaman or the end time. Russia, I hope you're listening. For this is so important for Russia today to understand. The body of Fir'aun was discovered in 1898. What are the implications if history is going to now repeat itself? Well, what happened one year earlier? In 1897, something happened. In 1897, in consequence of which Allah acted in 1898. In 1897, the first Zionist Congress took place in, uh, was it Basel in Switzerland? Theodor Herzl, I hope that's the way you pronounce the name convened the first Zionist Congress in Switzerland. And so now we know that history is now going to repeat itself. On this side, you have the Zionists who will take the place of Pharaoh. And on this side, you will have the weak people who have no power in the world. And they are the ones who are following Muhammad alayhi salatu wasalam together with those who are Christians and Jews who are also supporting the cause of justice. 
these will be on this side. One of the first things that they did as soon as the body of Pharaoh was discovered, one of the first things that they did after convening the first Zionist Congress in 1897 was to attack Constantinople to attack the Ottoman Islamic Empire, the Khilafah, which was in Constantinople. Today it's called Istanbul. If you look at the map of uh, that part of the world where you have the Bosphorus and Turkey on this side and Greece on that side, and across there is the, is the, uh, the Black Sea, and here's the Bosphorus, the waterway which takes you into the Mediterranean. And right there on the Bosphorus is the city of Constantinople, which is commanding the straits. And the Khalifa is there. In uh, previous lectures, I have dwelt on the legitimacy of the Ottoman Caliphate or Khilafa. That's not our subject today. But in order for you to pursue the Zionist goal, what is the Zionist goal? The Zionist goal is to bring the Jews back to the Holy Land, to reclaim it as their own, to recover the Holy Land for them. The Zionist goal is to restore a state of Israel in the Holy Land and get the Jews to believe that this is Holy Israel. The Zionist goal is to take that Israel and make it the ruling state in the world. So that when Israel rules the world, then a man can emerge in Israel, in Jerusalem, and declare, I am the Messiah. It's as easy as that. That's so simple. That's Islamic eschatology. And so now, they are, on, they are now in the home stretch. This is the last stage of the end of history when the body of Pharaoh is discovered. The first Arab Spring emerged directly after the body of Pharaoh was discovered. And in that first Arab Spring, we saw the Arabs being enticed, the Arabs being in, uh, deceived to revolt so that with the Arab revolt against the Ottoman Empire, the Islamic credentials of the Ottoman Empire will be destroyed. And it will be easier now to wage war on the Ottoman Empire, defeat it and destroy the Khilafah. The Khilafah is a part of Islam. When Allah says in the Quran, Ya ayyu alazina amanu, O you who have faith, faith in Allah. Atiyu Allah, obey Allah. Wa atiyu Rasul, and obey the Prophet, sallallahu ta'ala alayhi wa sallam. Wa uli al-amri minkum. And obey those in authority minkum from within your own ranks. So he's not talking about the Security Council of the United Nations. That's rubbish. He's not talking about the president and the prime minister and the government of Russia and the government of China and the government of the United States and the government of Canada. That's rubbish. They're not minkum. He's talking about government constituted by the Muslims in accordance with Allah's law. That is what he's talking about. That was the Khilafah state. It recognized Allah as sovereign. Today, nobody recognizes Allah as sovereign. No, not even Islamic Iran. Not even the Islamic Republic of Iran recognizes Allah as sovereign. Now, why? Because you become members of the United Nations organization. And Article 24 and 25, or 25 and 26 of the Charter of the United Nations declare that supreme authority resides with the Security Council in all matters pertaining to international peace and security. That's a very wide term. So this Security Council of the United Nations has sovereignty. 
not Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. They have supreme authority. Their law is the supreme law, not Allah's law. And you have a revolution in Iran, and you never bother to think about whether or not you should continue your membership in the United Nations. What kind of Islamic revolution is that? You have a revolution in Iran, and you never consider whether or not you should still continue to be a member of the nuclear non-proliferation treaty. And now, 30 years later, look at where you are. Hmm? Allah's supremacy, Allah's sovereignty is recognized in the Khilafah state. And the Zionist objective is to destroy the Khilafah state. Destroy the institution of Khilafah. So that when it is replaced by the secular model of a state which the Dajjal created in Europe, that will be such a momentous change in the world that all the rest of the world will easily succumb now and they'll all become secular states. And so what happened in that first Arab Spring affected all of mankind, not just the Muslim world. They attack the institution of Khilafah in 1902. That will be just three, five years after the first Zionist Congress and just four years after the body of Pharaoh was discovered. The French government gave their blessings for a con convention to take place in Paris of all the forces that were opposed to the Khalifa in Istanbul. They're called the Young Turks. Well, the Young Turks was one of the groups. There were also those who were not Turks. They were Armenians and so on. And this conference, this convention took place, conference took place in Paris in 1902. By 1900, was it 1908? Six years later, they're able to stage a revolution. And they're able to take over the Ottoman Empire six years later. And the Khalifa is now only a figurehead. They are running the show. Secular nationalist Turks now take over the Ottoman Empire in 1908. And the Ottoman Khalifa is just a figurehead. When they take over, what do they proclaim? They say that all religions are recognized as equal. <coughs> we say we must show respect for all religions, but truth and falsehood cannot be equal. Truth and corrupted truth cannot be equal. And if this is Allah's book, which is protected by him, and no falsehood could touch it from before, from behind, from on top, from below. Anyway, this is uncorrupted truth. How can this and other uh, constitution or this or that be equal? How can this be equal with corrupted versions of truth? But no, they say all religions are recognized as equal. They did a number of things. We don't have the time to mention it, but we'll do it in Cape Town to present their secular credentials in place of the Islamic Khilafah state. They sought to alienate the Arabs so that the Islamic credentials of the Ottoman Empire would be destroyed. So it could end up as a secular republic of Turkey. And by the time the war began in 1914, by the time the war began in 1914, the Ottoman Empire was already shaking. And eventually the Ottoman Empire collapsed. And eventually the Khilafah was abolished in 1924. The figurehead was abolished in 1924. This is the first Arab Spring. It is, of course, Turkey here, but the Arabs played a very important role in it. But now I want to turn to something else. That first Arab Spring, when the body of Pharaoh was discovered, resulted in attack in another direction as well. The Quran speaks about a people who will show love 
and compassion for Muslims. Allah says, وَلَا تَجِدَنَّ أَقْرَبَهُمْ مَوَدَّةً لِلَّذِينَ آمَنُوا الَّذِينَ قَالُوا إِنَّ النَّصَارَى That those who are Christians will be those who will show the greatest love and affection for you as Muslims. Which Christians are they that the Quran is talking about? Is this history or is this Akhiru Zaman? If you say it's history, fine. I say no. I say it's Akhiru Zaman. Who are the Christians who will show the greatest love and affection for you as Muslims? Which Christians are they? It couldn't be Western Christianity, which has joined in an alliance with the Jews to form the Zionist Alliance. It couldn't be the United States and Britain, which leads the Western Christianity, the Anglo-American Alliance, which controls power in the world today, which is the Gog and Magog world order. There's only one other Christianity left. And it is called Rum. There's a chapter of the Quran, a surah of the Quran, mention Rum. And that Rum is, West, is Orthodox Christianity. Orthodox Christianity. And the attack on Orthodox Christianity now takes place. When the Ottomans defeated uh, Rome and took over Constantinople, uh, and the history of this period of the destruction of the Khilafah uh, in Constantinople. I wrote a book entitled The Caliphate, the Hejaz, and the Saudi Wahhabi Nation State. That book was written about 35 years ago, the first edition. And I have just now finished the second edition, in which I have updated it, and including an Islamic eschatological analysis into the book, uh, and the book is now available, The Caliphate, the Hejaz, and the Saudi Wahhabi Nation State. In that book, I have explained the attack on Rome. They want to attack Russia because they know that in the end time, there will be an alliance between Muslims and Russia. Russia is the heart of Rome. Rome is also Armenia. Rome is also Greece. Rome is also Bulgaria. So what did they do? I think it was 1909. Britain and France embraced Russia in an entente, entente, a friendly, a friendly alliance. This is through the front door, the Anglo-American-Russian alliance. But through the back door, they are conspiring to destroy Russia. They are fomenting the communist revolution, the Bolshevik revolution. They are financing, they will eventually finance the Bolshevik revolution. The Trans-Siberian Railway is being constructed and they know why they want it finished. Because the troops are going to come along that railway, the Trans-Siberian Railway, to take over Russia. At that time, the capital was not Moscow. I think the capital was St. Petersburg. And the Tsar was in St. Petersburg. They financed it. Wall Street, the Zionists. So on the front door, you are shaking hands, and from the back door, you're stabbing them. Russia didn't know about it, and Russia went into the alliance. Hmm? And then when the Russian troops were about to take Constantinople, they, they had also promised Russia, when that alliance was made, that you will get Constantinople. If we defeat the Ottoman Empire, Constantinople will be yours. And when the war broke out in 1914, by 1916, it was all over for the, for the Ottoman Empire once they lost Makkah and Medina and lost the Hejaz. Sharif al Hussein has revolted, seven million pounds. And so now Russia, the Ottoman Empire is collapsing, and the Russian troops are advancing to Constantinople. It is at this time that the Zionists act to ensure that the Bolshevik Revolution takes place before the Russian troops could take Constantinople because they don't want Russia to take Constantinople. That's why the Bolshevik Revolution occurred at the time when it occurred. And the family of the Shah of the Tsar were all murdered. 
and a new government took over which was communist and godless. But that was not all. You have to be able to connect the dots to be able to understand and read history properly. It was not just that they did not want Russia to get Constantinople, more than that. 1917 is the year when British troops defeated the Ottoman army and took Jerusalem and took the Holy Land. And they did not want a rival with a claim to the Holy Land, not the Zionists, the Western Christians and Jews. And that is what Rome would have been, a rival. So by having the revolution in 1917 and Lenin taking over Russia and then 1922 the Soviet Union coming into being as an atheist state and Christianity in the whole of Rome is now being butchered, the impl implication is that Rome is silenced. That's why they had the communist revolution. So there, there'll be no rival None whatsoever, when they took control of the Holy Land, it'll be theirs with no other Christians in the way to be a rival to them and to contest their claim to control over the Holy Land. What I have done is to give you a taste. Only from the time of the body of Pharaoh being discovered, in 1898, the Congress in 19, 1897, the first Congress of Zionists, until 1924, and the abolition of the Khilafah. And all the events which occurred and transpired during this period of time to show how they are related to what is now happening. What is now happening is that they're moving in the final stretch at that time, Britain ruled the world. Britain was the ruling power. But over the last 100 years, the United States took over. And now we have the new Arab Spring. So that this Arab Spring will witness the transfer of power from the United States to Israel. The time has come now for Israel to attempt to rule the world. In the same way that there were great wars a hundred years ago, and the Second World War was a mopping up operation to ensure that the whole of Rome is now under the control of the communists, so too, a hundred years later, we have great wars right around the corner. And is this time for us to go and have dinner and go to sleep? Or should we be attempting to anticipate what's going to happen and to prepare ourselves for it to respond appropriately. If great wars are coming around the corner, what should we do? Does the Quran not order us to build power? In Surah Al-Anfal, we ask the leadership of Iran to kindly consider this verse of the Quran. We do it very politely because Iran declares that you are an Islamic Republic and you've just made an agreement in Geneva. But Allah, in that agreement, the very first men thing mentioned in that agreement is that Iran commits itself never to acquire nuclear weapons. Never to acquire nuclear weapons. In Surah Al-Anfal, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives an order. He says, وَعِدُّوا لَهُمْ مَسْتَطَعْتُمْ مِنْ قُوَّةٍ وَمِنْ رِبَاتِ الْخَيْلِ Build power. Build it to the maximum extent possible for you. Why? Muslims are ordered to build power, not to use it to commit aggression, not to oppress. No, not the Quran. Why then does Allah want us to build power? The answer is Turhibuna bihi adu wallahi wa adu wakum. 
that that power may deter your enemy and Allah's enemy. When they perceive you to be powerless, it's an open invitation for them to come and walk all over you, oppress you, break you up into bits and pieces and scatter you all over the place. Bombing all over Pakistan. <laughs> Killing the Pakistanis every day with drones. And what can Pakistan do? Nothing. Nothing. If you build power, then with that power you can deter them, provided you're prepared to use the power. You can deter them. Allah wants you to build power to deter the enemy from attacking you. And we know that the big wars are coming. Iran knows that. The big wars are coming. And when the big wars come, it is Israel that's going to be striking out. And don't you think she's going to use nuclear weapons? Huh? <laughs> well, then what should we do? Is this the time for Muslims to be trapped in a nuclear non-proliferation treaty? which is designed to ensure that they, the enemy, will have exclusive control over nuclear weapons. And they're the ones who are waging war. They're the ones who have, who have the objective of full spectrum dominance over all the rest of the world, military dominance. Waging war everywhere, helter skelter. Why? Because you do not have the power to be able to respond. That's why. They will not wage war on Russia because Russia has the power to respond. But Libya has no power to respond, so they can walk over Russia or Libya. Turhibuna bihi adu wallahi wa adu Build power that you may it may function as a deterrence. But the arrow spring is showing is that events are now occurring and the pace is moving faster and faster for Israel to intervene unilaterally and to, to take the initiative now in waging big wars. And of course, the Western Alliance will have to join. They can't stay aside, step aside. And when Israel takes over with these big wars that are coming, Israel will stake its claim to replace the United States as the next ruling state in the world. So there's a link between that Arab Spring and this Arab Spring, there's a continuity towards a goal that we know of. Nabi Muhammad alayhi salatu wasalam spoke 1400 years ago and described that man to us who will stand up in Jerusalem in an Israel that will be ruling the world and who will, be, who will declare that I am the Messiah. He said he would be a Jew. He'd be born of Jewish parents who never previously had any children. So he'd be the firstborn. That's important that he'd be the firstborn. And the parents, we must know who they are because you have to look to the lineage that they are from the house of David, Nabi Dawood alayhi salam, because that's what the Torah talks about. And this man will be young, powerfully built, and would have curls which the Orthodox Jews have at the side of the head. And this man is going to declare, I am the Messiah. And Nabi Muhammad والسلام, said, no, he will not be the Messiah. He would be Dajjal. This subject is important. We cannot ignore history. We have to return to history, to study it. My book, The Caliphate, The Hejaz, and The Saudi Wahhabi Nation State, which has just been published in the second edition, is a helpful book for you to read, to understand what's happening in the world. My book, Jerusalem in the Quran, which was published about 12 years ago, which has been translated, mashallah, into, I don't know, a dozen languages or more. Perhaps it's a textbook on Islamic eschatology. We are pioneering a new branch of knowledge now. I ask you, particularly the young scholars, I ask you to turn your attention now to this subject. An eschatological 
interpretation of history as we look to connect the dots between the first Arab Spring and the second Arab Spring in consequence of the discovery of the body of Pharaoh in 1898. I look forward to meeting you in Cape Town towards the end of January, inshallah. Please go to my website and check out the information and please register for the seminar. And may Allah take you safely to Cape Town that I can meet you there. Rabbana taqabbal minna inna ka anta samir alim wa tuba alayna ya maulana inna ka anta tawab rahim wa rahmatika ya arhamu rahim. Ameen. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has spoken to us about the sky above and he said that I have, we have ordained the lowest sky with lamps, referring to the stars as lamps. وَلَقَدْ زَيَّنَ السَّمَاءَ الدُّنْيَا بِمَصَابِحِ What is the implication of the use of the word lamp? What do we use a lamp for? We use a lamp to show us the way when we want to walk in the darkness. The lamp provides light so we can see. And so the stars in the sky are placed as lamps so we can see the direction in which to move. Of course, this is applicable for the if you are in Pretoria, if you are in Gaborone, if you are in Harare, if you are in Durban, if you are in Port Elizabeth, East London, wherever you are in Southern Africa, I hope you'll try to make it to the seminar uh, in Cape Town in late January on the topic from Arab Spring to Arab Spring, connecting the dots. Just go to my website and you'll be able to register for the seminar, insha'Allah. This, uh, we're breaking new ground. We're breaking new ground with this topic. Uh, what we're doing is applying our eschatology to history. It is an eschatological interpretation of history. Alhamdulillah wa kafa wa salatu wa salamu ala ibadihi alladhina astafa khususan ala afdalihim wa khatamin nabiyin muhammadin al-amin wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in wa ba'd. Fa'awudhu billahi min ash-shaytan rajim بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم ونزلنا عليك الكتابة بيانا لكل شيء وهدى ورحمة وبشرى للمسلمين صدق الله العظيم. We begin with Allah's blessed name. We praise Him and we glorify Him as He ought to be praised and glorified. And we pray for peace and for blessings on all His noble messengers and our Father Adam. Alayhi salam. And our father Abraham, from Arab Spring to Arab Spring, connecting the dots. This is not going to be a long lecture. It is meant to prepare you for an international Islamic seminar, which we've organized for uh, towards the end of January. You'll find the specific dates on my website. Uh, www.imranhussein.org uh, It will be uh, towards the end of January and it will be held in Cape Town, the beautiful South African city of Cape Town. A seminar which should last for about five days, I believe. And uh, it will be devoted to this subject. Uh, and so what we're doing today is actually introducing it to you and giving you a taste of what is to come in that seminar. If you are in Johannesburg, Ibrahim alayhi salam, 
on Moses, Musa alayhi salam, on Jesus, Nabi Isa alayhi salam, and on his mother, the Blessed Virgin Mary alayhi salam, and on the last of them all, the Blessed Prophet Muhammad sallallahu ta'ala alayhi wa sallam. Brothers and sisters, assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuhu. Uh, I greet you from the studios of the Islamic Broadcasting uh, Network, IBN, uh, of Trinidad and Tobago. I am grateful to its owner and its CEO, Brother Inshan Ishmael, and to the manager, the production manager, my dear friend, Brother Hasib Majid, who so kindly placed the studio at our disposal for this lecture uh, entitled 